In the last session, we saw how the convergence of the modern ecumenical movement and the renewal of the Second Vatican Council opened the door to a conversation aimed at an honest evaluation of past conflict and a reshaping of present and future relationships. In 1967, an official theological dialogue was established at the international level between representatives of the Lutheran World Federation and the Catholic Church. Dialogue at the international level has been complemented by the contributions of regional conversations in Germany, France, North America, and Australia. Today, we celebrate the many ways that 50 years of sustained dialogue have helped us to come to a deeper knowledge of one another and to dispel many misunderstandings about one another's practice and belief. Through dialogue, Lutherans and Catholics have discovered that they hold much more in common than they might have first imagined. Careful study has revealed that many positions once considered to be opposed must be seen as complementary they can no longer be judged as church dividing. Joint studies have been carried out on topics as diverse and as varied as the relationship between scripture and tradition, the role of the creed, the meaning of baptism, Eucharist, and ministry, the role of the papacy, the invocation of the saints and Mary. It would be impossible to treat all of these questions here. Instead, we will highlight some of the key moments in Lutheran-Catholic dialogue at the international level. But before doing so, it's important to say a word about the meaning of dialogue. As a rule, dialogue takes place in a context of fellowship and prayer. The bonds of mutual trust and friendship, the common celebration of faith, and the constant reminder of our dependent upon the guidance of God's Spirit are essential ingredients in these meetings. Biblical scholars, historians, pastors, and theologians revisit the scriptures and re-examine the Christian tradition in an effort to discern together a fuller and more accurate appreciation of the gospel. Dialogue is not a negotiation, nor is it the pursuit of a lowest common denominator. It is rather a common search for the truth. In dialogue, partners do not shy away from the hard questions, yet the focus is not on the perceived shortcomings of the other. Lutherans and Catholics listen self-critically to each other. Each brings a self-critical regard to bear on the teaching and practice of their own community, examining themselves in the light of the gospel. In all loyalty, they're attentive to those aspects of church teaching and practice that may need to be renewed and reformed in light of what they learn through dialogue with other Christians. The journey toward Christian unity involves both personal conversion and institutional renewal and reform. Dialogue and conversion go together. Those who take part in this dialogue of truth come to know and appreciate more fully both the gifts and the weaknesses of their own tradition. They come to know and love their fellow Christians more deeply and grow in love for the many riches found in their communities. Dialogue is a mutual exchange of gifts where we learn and receive from what God has done in the life of one another's communities. While the work of theological dialogue engages many specialists and scholars, Commitment to dialogue, prayer, and work for Christian unity is the responsibility of every Christian. Being a Christian implies a desire for the church, and the church is by its very nature one. Through official dialogue, Lutherans and Catholics have made great strides in overcoming disagreement. Of particular note is the growth in agreement on the doctrines relating to justification by faith, Eucharist, ministry, and the church. The first phase of the Lutheran Catholic International Dialogue began in 1967. 
already in its first report on the Gospel and the Church, published in 1972, it noted a far-reaching agreement on the central concern of Martin Luther's teaching, the doctrine of justification by faith. This question, which lies at the very heart of the Lutheran Reformation, centers on the understanding of Paul's teaching in the New Testament, that we are justified, brought into right relationship with God in Christ by the gift of faith alone. In the 1980s, important studies in Germany and North America helped to show that while Lutheran and Catholic theologies treat this question using differing language and approaches, they are nonetheless agreed upon the fundamental insight that our salvation depends entirely upon the free and gracious initiative of God's love and mercy. Where Luther understood faith in more biblical terms as the adherence of the whole person in response to God's free gift, the Council of Trent saw faith as an intellectual assent to Christian doctrine, which must be complemented by charity, the work of God's Spirit in us, bringing interior renewal and moving us to do good works. Beyond these differences in approach, Lutherans and Catholics agree that nothing we can do can ever earn God's favor or make us more deserving of God's gracious gift of love. Scholars on both sides argue convincingly that this doctrine, a key to understanding the outworking of God's grace in the life of the Church, need no longer be considered Church dividing. During a 1988 visit to the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity by a delegation from the Lutheran World Federation, the Lutheran World the Federation President, Landesbischof Johannes Hanselmann, and General Secretary Dr. Gunnar Stahlset asked that a formal process be initiated where the highest authorities of the Lutheran and Catholic communions would officially receive the achievements of the theological dialogue. The most significant fruit of this initiative was the signing, after much public debate and consultation, of the historic Joint Declaration on the Doctrine of Justification. It was signed at Augsburg, Germany on October 31st of 1999 by Dr. Ishmael Noko, then General Secretary of the Lutheran World Federation, and Cardinal Edward Cassidy, President of the Pontifical Council for Promoting Christian Unity in the Vatican. The Joint Declaration affirms a consensus on the basic truths of faith beyond differences in Lutheran and Catholic emphases and language. It declares that the condemnations of the Reformation on this question cannot be applied to Lutheran and Catholic teaching today. This fundamental consensus on the doctrine of God's grace places all other disagreements on matters pertaining to sacramental life and ministry into an entirely new context. Since the signing of the Joint Declaration, other Christian communions, including Methodists, Anglicans, and Reformed, have begun to align themselves as well with this historic agreement. Lutheran Catholic dialogue on Eucharistic doctrine has uncovered significant agreement between Lutheran and Catholic positions. Catholics and Lutheran Christians together confess the real and true presence of the Lord in the Eucharist. They agree that through the creative power of God's Word and the action of the Holy Spirit, the bread and the wine of the Lord's Supper become the body and blood of Christ. Contemporary biblical and liturgical studies have enabled both Lutherans and Catholics to recover a fuller understanding of the liturgy as a memorial or anamnesis. The Eucharistic memorial is not a mere recollection of events in the historic past, nor is it a repetition of Calvary in this sacrament, the self-giving of Christ, completed once for all in the sacrifice of the cross, is made actual, enabling us to participate in his saving acts today. 
Although there remain differences in pastoral practice, Lutherans and Catholics agree that the complete form of the sacrament comprises communion in the bread and the wine. Christ is truly present in his entirety in both the bread and the wine of the sacrament. Martin Luther, in his teaching on the priesthood of all believers, took very seriously the fact that the New Testament authors reserve the word priest for the entire congregation of the baptized and do not apply it to office holders in the church. Nonetheless, Luther did not regard every Christian as a pastor. The Second Vatican Council, following the example of the New Testament, reserves the term priest, in Latin sacerdos, for the priestly people of God, and uses the more biblical expression presbyter to refer to ordained ministers. The Council's teaching emphasizes the equal dignity of all the baptized faithful. Lutherans and Catholics are agreed that within the priestly people of God, Christ and the Spirit call some to a special ministry. Those who are called to this service are ordained through the laying on of hands. Historically, the Catholic Church has been reticent to recognize the orders of Lutheran pastors, most of whom were not ordained by bishops standing in a succession from the time of the Apostles. While Lutherans and Catholics understand the succession in the faith of the Apostles as a continuity of teaching, Catholics see succession in the office of bishop as an essential structure that ensures this continuity in the Apostles' ministry. Both Lutherans and Catholics recognize the necessity for a ministry of unity and oversight to ensure the Christian community's fidelity to the witness of the early church. For Lutherans, this ministry may be accomplished by other ministers and structures rather than by the office of bishop alone. Together, we confess that the church is apostolic and that all members of the church have particular roles to play in handing on the gospel faithfully. The teaching of the Second Vatican Council reflects a renewed understanding of the office of bishop as one who presides over the faith of the local church. Through a collegial exercise of leadership with other bishops, the bishop of each diocese watches over the bond of communion with other local churches. Growth in understanding has led a number of Lutheran churches to reestablish the practice of ordaining bishops to fulfill this role. Today, Lutheran and Catholic bishops carry out similar responsibilities of oversight. Structures of decision-making and leadership are being renewed in Catholic and Lutheran communities today under the guidance of the Holy Spirit. Dialogue continues in order to develop and strengthen agreement on the meaning and the role of the episcopate. Today, there are many calls to draw practical consequences from our progress through dialogue for a more generous, mutual recognition of ministries. Each time they recite the Nicene Creed, Lutherans and Catholics confess their shared belief that the Church of Christ is one, holy, Catholic, and apostolic. The Lutheran Catholic Commission on Unity speaks of the growing recognition of one another's apostolicity, that fundamental attribute of the Church which expresses our fidelity to the witness of Christ's earliest followers. Catholic teaching recognizes the enduring presence of the Church of Christ wherever the constitutive elements of the Church are found. Similarly, Luther insisted on the importance of continuing the many practices of the Church which enable contemporary communities to remain in the faith of the Apostles. These included continuity in the practice of baptism, the Lord's Supper, the Office of Keys, the Call to Ministry, public gathering for worship in praise and confession of faith, and the bearing of the cross as Christ's disciples. In light of these parallels, Lutheran 
Catholic dialogue maintains that we are justified today in recognizing one another's communities as possessing an apostolic character. That is to say, both communities strive to live faithfully from the teaching and practice handed on from the first witnesses to the resurrection of Christ. This partial recognition, an affirmation of the real, if imperfect, communion that we share, is possible despite the fact that we have not yet arrived at a point of full agreement on every point of doctrine. Increased mutual understanding and growth in agreement lead us to reconsider the judgments of the past as we move from conflict to deepening communion. Fifty years ago, no one could have imagined how much we would grow together in unity. This progress, a real gift of God's Spirit working in us, gives us confidence to move forward together along the path of reconciliation.